It is an autumn evening in the Somme, northern France. Out in one of the thousands of fields, a farmer with a tractor is finishing the day's plowing when the blade suddenly catches on something in the soil. He stops the tractor and jumps out of the cab. Somewhere in the back of his mind he knows that his life could be in danger. But he is tired after a long day's work and wants nothing more than to get the plow unstuck and go home to his family. Soon he finds the cause. In the deep furrow, his eyes meet something dull and metallic. This is not the first time he has encountered something like this, and since it has never proved to be a danger before, he takes a shovel from the tractor and starts digging. The bang can be heard for miles, like an ominous echo from the past. One hundred years after the war to end all wars ended, it is still reaping its victims. Along the thin line that 1914 to 1918 was known as the Western Front, we today find picturesque towns and villages, but their names still drip of the horrors of the Great War. Marne, Ypres, and Verdun. Young men on both sides of the warring nations dropped like flies into the trenches from shell attacks, gas, bullets and disease. Yes, the most horrific scenes of war known to mankind was played out and none was bloodier than the Battle of the Somme. The Germans had tried to end the war at Verdun, but their attack failed after a battle that claimed 306,000 lives. At a meeting between the British and French allies, the French commander-in-chief Joseph Joffre threw a tantrum. The French were hard-pressed at Verdun and Joffre wanted to buy his troops some time by striking the Germans elsewhere on the Western Front. British General Douglas Haig agreed to the proposal. According to an earlier agreement, the British and French would launch the Somme Offensive in August, but now it was decided that it would start in June. The plan was to attack the Germans from several directions, Italians in the south, French along the whole front, while it fell to the British to do their part at the Somme. On June 24, 1916, the British launched the largest artillery bombardment in the history of the British Army. 1,000 pieces fired 1.5 million shells over four days. The guns could sometimes be heard as far as London, 270 kilometers away. For the first two days the artillery hit its targets, but the fact that many shells did not even explode and that most of the projectiles were shrapnel shells, better suited to wounding people than destroying barbed wire, trenches and bunkers, meant that the rain of fire did not have the intended effect, something the British would realize far too late. Also on June 26, Dark clouds descended on the landscape and thousands of shells were fired blindly. The difficulty of determining whether the shells had hit their targets led the Allies on June 28 to postpone the infantry attack for two more days. Throughout this time there were contradictory reports about the condition of the barbed wire and the manning of the German trenches. Occasionally, however, they hit their targets. The German officer Klaus von Rosen described in a memoir how he was buried alive during the British bombardment. Von Rosen had found himself in front of the infantry in a very large covered room with only one entrance, together with 16 other men, half of whom were wounded. A hit of the greatest caliber had destroyed the only exit in a single blow. In the hours that followed, two men had lost their minds. One had become so violent that he had to be tied up and the other had laughed hysterically while taking off his shirt and calmly eating his own arm in the happy belief that it was some particularly delicious meat. And so he too had to be tied up. The air had quickly become worse and worse inside. Von Rosen's heart was pounding, his head ached as if it wanted to burst, and when the first vague sounds of shovels were heard he dared not believe his ears. When rescue came and the fresh air flooded in, it was too much for his poor lungs at once. For days and weeks Von Rosen likened his lungs to a festering wound. The infantry would begin its long-awaited attack at 7.30 on the morning of July 1st. In the hours before, the trenches were filled to the brim with tense anticipation, doubt, faith and sheer terror. Three minutes before the attack, at 7.27, the British captain Billy Neville kicked two soccer balls straight at the German fortification. This was to demonstrate that thanks to the relentless artillery fire, crossing the so-called no-man's-land would be as easy as running across a soccer field. 
At exactly 7.30 the promised signal to the infantry to climb out of the trenches sounded. The German soldiers had fortified themselves well and the artillery bombardment had not had the intended effect. As the British and French climbed out of the trenches, thousands of German machine guns were pointed towards them. When they got halfway across and discovered that much of the barbed wire was still intact, and that they had to crowd the narrow openings to get through, the Germans opened fire. The soldiers fell in great tidy heaps. During the 1st of July, 60,000 British men were wounded or killed. The losses would certainly have been higher if the German gunners had not occasionally been so moved by the slaughter that they sometimes allowed the attackers to retreat without firing at them. Among the French troops waiting to attack the German trenches was an American named Alan Seeger. He had graduated from Harvard six years earlier and then lived in Paris for four years. Seeger was a poet and loved the city's bohemian atmosphere. When war broke out, he enlisted in the Foreign Legion to defend the country he had grown to love. During his service, he continued to write. On the eve of the great British attack on the Somme, he wrote, I will write you soon if I get through all right. If not, my only earthly care is for my poems. I am glad to be going in first wave. If you are in this thing at all, it is best to be into the limit. And this is the supreme experience. Alan Seeger's subsequent fate was told by a friend who, unlike many others, survived the battle. At 8 o'clock on the morning of July 1st, we received our orders. The great offensive was to begin at 9 o'clock, but we were not to be there. We were reserves and would be notified of the day and time. We were to attack later. Then we were sent to unload 8-inch shells from trucks. Suddenly a voice was heard shouting for our companies to come in and for us to go to the front line. At about 4 o'clock in the afternoon the order came that we should get ready to attack. No one could help but think about what the next few hours had in store. A few minutes of anxiety, but after we lined up, most faces became calm and peaceful, as if something had come over us. Two battalions were to attack Belloy and Santerra and our company was in reserve. The companies of the first wave were lined up in a cornfield. The bayonet glittered above the corn which had already grown quite high. The first section, Seeger's section, formed the right wing and vanguard. My section formed the left. After a short advance we lay on our stomachs and I could see the first section advancing in front of us towards Belle and Santer. I saw Seeger and waved to him. He responded with a smile, but so pale can be. His long silhouette was clearly visible in the green cornfield. He was the tallest in the whole section. He held his head high and there was pride in his eyes. Soon he ran forward with his bayonet at the ready. That was the last I saw of him. On the German side, the losses were also severe in the following weeks and months. When von Rosen describes a counterattack he participated in against the British the nightmarish nature of the infantry attack appears. The front line was filled with heavily armed German soldiers with screwed bayonets and cartridge belts. Their bags were full, their knives ready for action and scissors ready to cut through barbed wire obstacles. We, the other officers, checked our pistols. Me with my large browning and breast pockets full of loose cartridges and spare magazine. Then the artillery moved forward and we could attack. Bayonets and pistols worked. The best picture I could give of such close combat is a comparison with the movie in its first stage of development. There are flashes and sparkles, shadowy figures appear. One second you can't see anything, the next there's a bright light, and then an orchestra of the roar of cannons, the rattle of grenades, the clatter of machine guns and the whistle of rifle shots, the whine of bullets and the short yelp of pistols, the cries of the wounded and the moans of the dead. That battle raged half the night. When the enemy got the upper hand, I seized my knife to defend myself to the utmost. Right next to me an enemy, a giant figure, was about to throw a hand grenade at me. Indeed, I did not know that I had the knife in my hand until I felt it go all the way to the hilt. At the same moment I received a violent blow, so that I lost consciousness. Friend and foe rushed upon us as we lay there and trampled us into the mud. When I woke up, the battle was over. The man I had stabbed was lying right next to me. He looked horrible and the memory of that sight often haunts me. While most allowed themselves to go lamb-like to the slaughter on the Somme, there were those who were simply unable to do so. 
On the morning of September 18, 1916, a British private named Harry Farr was arrested. Farr was born in 1891. He was uneducated and lived in poverty. He enlisted in 1908 at the age of 17 and when the First World War broke out, he left his wife Gertrude and young daughter Gertie to join up. During the war Farr was hospitalized several times for shell shock. His wife Gertrude said that the nurses had to write his letters home for him as he trembled too much to hold the pen. As soon as Farr was discharged from hospital, he was sent back to the front. On September 17, 1916, his battalion was ordered to the front line and on the way they came very close to British artillery bombardment. Farr told his commanders that he was not feeling well and was not fit to fight. But as he was not wounded or otherwise physically unwell, he was speaking to deaf ears and a short time later, Farr was gone. Not until 11 o'clock in the evening he was found by his sergeant major at the transportation lines next to a brazier. After that Farr had told the officer that he couldn't stand the sound of artillery and gunfire. The sergeant major is said to have replied, You are a coward and you will go to the trenches. I give nothing for my life and I give nothing for yours and I'll get you shot. I will blow your brains out if you don't go. The commanding officer arranged for a corporal to transport Farr back to the front. But on the way back a wrestling match broke out between the two and Farr managed to escape back to the transport lines where he later was found again. On the morning of September 18th, he was arrested for disobeying orders and charged with cowardice. On October 2nd, he was court-martialed and forced to defend his case by himself. Farr was asked why he did not seek medical help after his arrest and he replied that he felt better after getting away from the artillery. Despite this, after 20 minutes he was found guilty and sentenced to death. Not all those sentenced to death were executed. In the case of those sentenced to death for cowardice, only about 3% were executed. But at the time of Farr's sentence, many people, including Douglas Haig, were skeptical of the army's ability to maintain morale and Haig therefore signed his death warrant to make an example. At 6 a.m. on October 18, 1916, Farr was shot by 12 men from his own regiment. He was offered a blindfold but declined, saying he wanted to look his executioners in the eye. Farr was not alone. As early as 1914, the first reports of shell-shocked soldiers with symptoms such as sudden muteness, blindness and deafness began to emerge. One civilian eyewitness told of a soldier shaking so much that two comrades were unable to hold him while he drooled and scratched his mouth. But the symptoms could be highly variable. Recurrent nightmares and crippling anxiety were common. What most people had in common was not as medical science believed at the time that they had been in close proximity to an exploded grenade. The number of unreported cases is believed to be large. At least 80,000 British soldiers were affected. The German figure is 613,000, but also includes other mental illnesses. The US, which participated towards the end of the war, puts the figure at 70,000. In 2006, Farr received a posthumous pardon and in the same year a monument was erected in Staffordshire called Shot at Dawn to all the soldiers executed for cowardice, for there was certainly no question of cowardice. Today we would call it acute stress reaction or post-traumatic stress. In total, more than 1 million soldiers were killed or wounded during the battle. The Allies captured a mere 125 square kilometers of bombed out terrain. This means that the Battle of the Somme is not only one of the bloodiest battles in human history, but also one of the most futile. Commander-in-Chief Douglas Haig could have waited for better weather and ordered a barrage in front of the attacking troops who would then have had a chance to take the German lines. This method had been used successfully in the past, but the French demand for an attack on the Germans carried more weight. In many British schools, students are given variations on the essay question, does Haig deserve the epithet Butcher of the Somme? Or can he be said to be a war hero? To those who walk the green plains, forests and manicured lawns of the Somme today, the battle may seem distant or even non-existent. But a significant number of locals testify to something different. flickering lights and stifled screams at night in the fields. Places where the animals refuse to go. Stories of children visiting the battlefields with their parents and seeing figures or shapes among the trees are numerous. When the British medium Peter Bowers 
visited the battlefield in 1975 with a TV crew. He described in detail how soldiers still wander the fields in a fog of confusion, isolation and total abandonment. When he arrived at Highwood, one of the last forests taken by the British and where the remains of 8,000 soldiers still lies, he experienced an abandonment so immense that he said that if ever a bird sang in those trees, it would have needed a lot of courage. In the 900 square meter forest, he sees men wandering around holding on to each other, blinded by their own pain. The pain so intense, as Bowers puts it, that if Jesus Christ was ever crucified, it was here. But even for those who doubt the visions and experiences of a medium, the fact remains that the war is still taking its toll. It is estimated that for every square meter of the Western Front, a ton of shells were fired and as many as one in four never exploded. To this day, French and Belgian farmers collect what is popularly known as the Iron Harvest. In Ypres alone, 358 people have died and 535 have been injured since the last shot was fired in 1980. In October 2007, Joseph Verdu, aged 58, was killed while lighting a fire in his garden. Another farmer suffered large yellow blisters all over his arm after burying irrigation pipes and finding a grenade that was leaking black liquid. He did not know then that mustard gas could be a liquid. The supposedly youngest survivor of the First World War was born in 1983. When she was eight years old in 1992, she had her left leg blown off during an outing when one of the logs the children threw into the fire turned out to be a grenade. As all the other injured war veterans she now receives 800 euros a month and half the price on train tickets. But the terrible battle of the Somme also persists in other ways. One of the soldiers who took part in the battle was a young Oxford professor who saw his friends die at the front. He contracted trench fever and was sent to a hospital to recover. Once there, he began writing a remarkable story, a vast and imaginary mythology called the Silmarillion. Many years later, when J.R.R. Tolkien wrote The Lord of the Rings, he included part of the psalm in the book of the Two Towers, which became the Dead Martians, an old battlefield near Mordor where the dead still stare up from the bottom. As for the poet Alan Seeger, it would turn out that his only worldly concern, his poetry, was completely unfounded. Seeger may have died, but his poetry survived the machine guns. I have a rendezvous with death, at midnight in some flaming town, when spring trips north again this year, and I to my pledged word am true. I shall not fail that rendezvous. Seeger kept his promise. It happened on July 1, 1916. On the Somme, 